Good evening, everybody. This is Victor Dover. I'm a Dover Coal Partners town planner and urban designer. Uh, tonight, the question is, Lake Wales, what's your future? Or to each of you who have signed up for this webinar, what's your vision for the future of Lake Wales? Lake Wales Envisioned is a big, ambitious, once-in-a-lifetime planning effort that the city and its partners have undertaken uh, that when we're done, will guide growth and conservation throughout the city and beyond into its utility service area uh, for many coming decades. So the foundation of this plan is community input. And in order to get the best possible input, we always like to pause before we begin putting pens on paper and ask ourselves, what are the best practices? What's the latest good information about how cities should grow? What makes the most sense? And we get a chance to do a little bit of that tonight with my friend, Joe Minicosi. The plan that we're going to produce with Lake Wales Envisioned is intended to be economically and environmentally sensible. It's meant to be worthy of historic Lake Wales uh, and representative of the community's priorities. Now, this work is being undertaken by our big team, the same uh, uh, planning expert folks who led the city's award-winning plan for the core of town called Lake Wales Connected. Um, and so this new initiative, which we call Lake Wales Envisioned, widens the scope to cover the city as a whole and beyond it, including potential future growth at the edge. So we're thinking about the whole mix, the future growth at the edge, the transformation and retrofit of suburban areas uh, in the middle, and the reinvigoration of the core historic neighborhoods in the center. There will be a whole lot of opportunities to interact with the city staff and the planning team as this process goes on, we'll have in-person events and online events like tonight, um, and of course, anytime on this website. So you can learn more about the project and about the upcoming Visioning Charette at lakewalesenvisioned.com. There's an events page where you can explore what's coming up and an engage page where you can share your ideas. I just wanna say thank you to the organizations that have volunteered to be uh, co-sponsors and partners in the effort. This is being led by the city of Lake Wales government, but they have reached out and added to the team uh, organizations like the Lake Wales Chamber, uh, our friends at Bach Tower Gardens, uh, the universities, the University of Miami and Rollins College, Lake Wales Main Street, Lake Wales News and Lake Wales Heritage, uh, the folks at Wales Point Restaurant and Bar, Lots have joined in, including 1,000 Friends of Florida, the non-for-profit advocate for growth management. And, and, and 1,000 Friends joining in on this effort is proof that what we are doing here is of statewide importance. It matters for Lake Wales, and it matters for the whole of Florida. And the information we get tonight is going to be useful as we work on the upcoming charrette. I think you'll also find, if you've tuned in from outside Lake Wales um, or not, that this is useful information in any community. April 14th through 20th, we have a community planning charrette, um, and there are all sorts of events you can decide how to plug into, uh, culminating in a work in progress review of, the, of what we've got at the end of that week on April 20th over at the Lake Wales Art Center. So with that, I am uh, going to uh, ask Joe, our friend Joe Minicosi to turn on his camera, and I'll do a short introduction, Joe. Um, just to let the folks know who, uh, who's here. Uh, Joe Minicosi is recognized, and I quote, as one of the 100 most influential urbanists of all time. And that's because of his work developing new ways to think about and visualize land use, urban design, and the associated economics. Joe's gonna help tonight explain and visualize land use, uh, he's going to help us understand market dynamics that are created by tax and land use policies. Well, that may sound dry, but let me tell you, he makes it interesting with visuals and amazing analytic tools. Uh, you've seen those tools in places like the Wall Street Journal and many other publications. Joe has a firm called Urban3, uh, which he'll tell you more about. They work to establish better conversations among all the professionals involved, all the policymakers and elected officials and the public to help address the creative challenges of urbanization. Joe holds a master's degree from Harvard um, 
as well as the University of Miami. And I'm going to ask Joe to, uh, yeah, I'll follow about the U. And Joe, why don't you share your screen and get us started? And as we go along, we'll have other panelists here with us to help uh, answer questions that come up or help people troubleshoot. We'll, um, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. You can use the Q&A button on your screen uh, to uh, type in a question. Amy Groves, project director for this Lake Wales and Visions effort, is going to be collecting all those questions, seeing where they need to be combined, and then uh, hitting Joe with them in the last 10 or 15 minutes of our hour. So with that, Joe Minicosi. Thanks, Victor. Can you hear me okay? And also, just for, every, yeah, for everybody, I'm going to go through a lot of slides pretty quickly. Um, you'll have this recorded, but also we'll send you a PDF copy of all of this so you can have it um, have it at home. Um, thank you, uh, Lake Wales, for uh, bringing me to town, so to speak. Um, I have lived in Florida for about 12 years uh, before I'm moving up to North Carolina. Um, so I'm very familiar with, with your town and the central part of the state. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of data, a lot of information, and I'm going to just go ahead and put my lesson up front that, that cities are places in time the same way that I'm a place in time. And so if you look at my DNA, this is how I started my life when I was three months old and I actually had hair. And this is my trajectory. I'm going to be my grandfather, whether I like it or not. There's a lot of things I can't change in that path. There's a lot of things that I can see happening with me as I get older. Um, or more importantly, I look at, again, when I had hair, uh, my, my parents and my dad in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm Italian. I can't change that. I also can't change the fact that my family has a genetic predisposition to heart disease. So I have to do things to plan myself going forward. I have to eat right. I have to exercise, things like that. So if you could think of, of Lake Wales in the future, what sibling do you want to have or what parent do you want to look at or grandparent? What city do you want to see in the state of Florida or anywhere and say, we don't want to have those habits, but we want to have those other habits. And these are choices you're going to make as you grow forward. But you have to also understand the DNA that you currently have within you um, that's happened maybe 100 years ago. So I currently live in Asheville. A lot of people in Florida know where Asheville is. It's up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, we're known and celebrated for our, our bluegrass music, our beer. We've got 40 breweries, 40. Um, we're only 90,000 people. That's a lot of beer. That's 2,500 people per brewery, if you want to do the math on that. And like any quirky little mountain town, we have men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your quirky little mountain place, typical. Um, that's a joke. But Asheville started, it was actually the second largest city in North Carolina, and then it fell flat on its face. I won't go through the full history, but Asheville, when it was coming out of the, uh, the, uh, the got paid off its debt in the 70s, they cut a highway through the north side of downtown, which became the Crosstown Expressway. And uh, I love that they blew the mountain open and put it on a postcard. This is what is called the bow cutcher cut. You just rip the mountain open. Um, on the other side of the cut, the mall happened and our downtown died. So Asheville had a downtown that was alive and we essentially killed it. Um, these are shots of downtown Asheville from not too long ago. These are the 80s, the 90s. And the saving grace of Asheville is that they were too poor to tear anything down. So they just had these buildings laying fallow. That's a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right there in, in, the, in the foreground. And we had this attitude that we're not urban, we're not a city, that we're just rural mountain people. That's who we are. We're not Miami. Don't tell me to be Miami, that kind of stuff. We're not Charleston. Um, there was a lot of things that happened. Uh, there was a lot of players involved, the city, the county, private investors, private developers, community activists. Many people, many hands started the process of changing downtown. I'm closely associated with this fellow here, Julian Price who started a company called Public Interest Projects. I used to work for Public Interest Project. We're actually still in their office. Um, and, and basically, Julian put 15 million, uh, sorry, $25 million of his own money at risk to do development in the downtown and also seed businesses. So he bought up buildings, it's mostly about making apartments downtown. So this is one of the buildings before and after. Uh, it's one of the bookstores downtown called Meloprops. And it's also apartments above. Now, the work that we were doing at Public Interest Projects was a lot of rehab, business incubation, stuff like that. But, but we were also bringing information to our community to get folks to realize, why does it matter for everybody else what we do in the downtown? And what's the data that drives our community? Not how you feel or what you think is happening or any kind of touchy-feely stuff like that. What's the hardcore data 
about how cities operate. And what's kind of phenomenal is we don't look at the, the land as a product. We don't look at the buildings as a product. It's essentially a crop, if you will. So if you know a farmer, a farmer is going to know the, the orange yield um, in an orange farm per acre. They're going to know the crop and how it produces and how much water is needed, how much labor is needed, all of that. So if we look at a building the same way and say, what's this crop yield? Um, so we put in ground floor retail, second floor office, upper story residential. Uh, the city invested in the streetscape. Some people actually accused us of being subsidized for that garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. Fine. The downtown infrastructure is expensive. Got it. Totally understand that. But we fixed this building and took it from $300,000 of tax value to $11 million of tax value, which represents a 3,500% increase in taxes in just 15 years, which is a tremendous growth. Do you have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Wouldn't you like that? And again, people have biases. They're like, well, Joe, that's cute and everything, but we've got this Walmart over here at $20 million. Okay, double the value. I get it. Fair enough. But it also took 34 acres of our farm, of our city, to make that happen versus our 0.2 acres. So it's really the wrong way of looking at it if you just look at the gross number. So rather than total value, this is the tax yield per acre of our building versus theirs, which is 100 times the tax production, double the retail taxes, a lot more jobs, and more or sorry, more people and more jobs. So if you just look at the brass tax of the numbers and make things apples to apples and look at the per acre yield, you'll see the productivity of your own community. I just blazed through a lot of stuff. This isn't complex math. This is fifth grade division. This is stuff we already know how to do. So think of it a different way. If we talk about cars, could you imagine if I said my truck gets 650 miles per tank and th this is the coolest thing ever is the best You'd laugh at me because you'd know that all tanks are different sizes. We don't compare tank cars that way. We gauge efficiency on the gallon, not the tank. So rather than per tank, let's say per gallon, the numbers change. We should all be driving BMW Assetas. I'm being cute about this as a joke, but I'm trying to drive home the point that we do this for a $3 commodity. We understand this. We know how to do this. Just take that same thinking into real estate. Also, but understand how does this affect your tax gains and losses in your community? I started doing this in about 2009. I actually presented at a planning conference and I put this quote up on the slide for all of my peers, all my professional friends and everybody that works in this field. And, and, I, and I asked the audience, show of hands, who understands how tax assessment policy works and how it generates revenues for your community? Who can, who can do the math on that? I was expecting a couple of nerds to raise their hand, but no one raised their hand and I was blown away. We're functionally illiterate about how the commodity of our cities work from a financial standpoint. And, and taxes matter because taxes pay for stuff, right? This cash flow of how the city operates. Our city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. Those acres that are there are all the acres that we get. So if you look at that city as a farm, it's like, this is your product, right? Um, my city cannot annex land. My state legislator, legislature made it illegal for Asheville to annex land until 2026. So all the acres that we've got are what we've got. So the city is incorporated. So if you look up the word incorporate, it says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So by law, the city is incorporated. Our county is incorporated. My state and your state are both incorporated, and so is our country. Uh, Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert show that in 2016, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. I'm such a nerd, I looked it up. There's the federal law on the bottom of the slide that lists us as a federal corporation. So it has a cash flow. It has. It, it's not a socialist corporation. It's it's essentially a cooperative corporation between everybody that's a shareholder in the community. So my city, at fourteen billion dollars of taxable value, is seven times the value of Ted Turner. Now, would I expect Ted Turner to just make his decisions by what he sees on Facebook? Of course not. So I'm expecting him to do data and understand things. I expect the same out of my mayor and my city council and anybody that is on the planning commission or whatever else. Understand the number of your numbers in your city. So we've done this all over this country, 40 different states, a bunch of stuff in Florida, I'll show you in a second. But it's real simple. For every dollar of taxes, somebody pays to the county in county taxes per acre out to the county, their brother in single family housing in the city is paying about five times that. Here's the Walmart, there's the mall. This is a two-story building, a three-story building, and a six-story building. Notice how it jumps up once you start stacking your stories. You're essentially stacking your dollar bills. So and I'm, not, I'm not putting skyscrapers in here. It's the six-story building. Y'all have a building taller than that. So it's like, this is getting people to understand that the, the wealth that you can have in your community. Incidentally, when I first started doing this, everybody's like, what's your problem, man? You just hate Walmart. 
Um, I don't, I just want you to understand that we, everybody's got a Walmart and that's pretty much everybody. And that's what a big box does. I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference, um, which is a very nerdy conference. It makes a planning conference feel like Burning Man. It's like this squarest conference ever. Um, this guy, who was the head of Walmart's real estate, uh, Charles Terrell, got up and did this amazing presentation at eight o'clock in the morning on how cheap Walmarts are. Th think about that for a second. There's 3,000 assessors in one room, and this guy is showing how cheap the buildings are. Now, assessors are agnostic. If it's a cheap building, it's a cheap building. They don't care. They're just like, all right, thanks. Thanks for giving us the data. So he's getting all of his property tax bills lowered in one meeting. That's incredibly efficient. I thought that was awesome. Now, I used to also work, I used to also work in government. It was sort of heartbreaking to see him do that because he's essentially going to get paying the least amount of taxes in every community in the country. So I walked up to the microphone and I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? How long will they last? And he said, 15, 20 years, we designed the building to depreciate it as fast as possible. We'll build another building and depreciate it down again. We don't care about the buildings that are throwaway. So don't hate the player, hate the game. Understand the game and it's your corporation and they're just taking advantage of the policies that are there. That's all. Don't hate the player, hate the game. So if they're coming into your community, just be aware that's a 15 to 20 year relationship, which is a life cycle of a cat. That's all it's going to be there. I'm a dog person. This is a joke. But I want you to understand that there's architectural commodities are also a cash flow commodity, and there is finance that's driving those forms. I would argue that people don't see it. One is tax policy is kind of boring. It's kind of nerdy. It's complex. The other thing is we just don't visualize it in a way that people can see it. So if I can show you the inside of your brain, I can do a CAT scan in your head and show you your creative thought process in green versus your brainstem activity in blue. Can I just do an economic MRI of your community? So stepping out, this is my county. Um, I've got non-taxable land like Mount Mitchell over here, which is a big federal park and Pisgah Forest. I've got low value in green. I've got high value in purple. This big purple splotch right here is the Biltmore Estate. That's America's largest house. That one house is worth $100 million, which is insane. Pretty cool, huh? But realize it's also a 180,000 square foot house sitting on 8,000 acres of land. So it's the biggest gas tank sitting on top of a big gas tank. It's not going to show you the productivity. So rather than total value, here's value per acre. The map just changed. I'll just show it to you in 3D. So this is showing you the relative potency of our entire county and where the county is getting all of its money. Where do you think downtown Asheville is? It's this big purple thing shooting off the map. Now, our community is 90,000 people. We've got a little cousin called Black Mountain over here, which is about 13,000 people. It's, it's about your size. And you can see his little downtown popping off the map right there. So that's what you get in your community. This is a little bit of new urbanism over here called Cheshire, kind of models after the downtown. Now, for folks that live out here called in Fairview, they think they're paying a lot of taxes because they might not know what anybody else pays in taxes. So show them. And rather than hate on the downtown, how about a thank you card for all the wealth that we've we produced for the community? So our, our attitude is to show people stuff. Don't just talk about it. Let's see what the math on it. And again, when I first started doing this, everybody's like, well, Joe, that's Asheville. We're different. We're unique. And it's like, okay, well, here's Kansas City. Can you tell where downtown is? It's a big purple thing right here. They also have this thing called Country Club Plaza, which is like a second downtown. Um, this is Bozeman, Montana. Do you want to guess where downtown is? Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, you see a pattern, uh, Brevard, North Carolina. This is a town of 8,000 people. When we showed this, the, may the mayor's name is Mayor Jimmy. Like He's been mayor for like 25 years at the time that we did this uh, show. And he goes, well, I could tell where downtown is. That's pretty cool. You know, it's just, it's not that hard. Just, just visualize the economics and understand what you're getting out of it. So this is all spatial analysis. I know this joke only works for people over the age of 35, so hopefully you'll all get it. Um, and it's just putting the numbers on the map so people can see it. Um, I did a, a presentation in Winter Haven just in your county up in 2019, and it just ran some numbers on your Lowe's and your Walmart. Here's your what your Lowe's looks like in your Walmart. Um, here's the taxes they paid per acre, total taxes in 2019. So Walmart's a little bit more than, than, than Lowe's. But just to put it in perspective, this little house is producing almost as much as that Walmart. You know, it's, that's the numbers. Um, 
going into Main Street, these are a couple buildings that we grabbed. Um, this is the uh, DeWitt Taylor's, the Taylor Hotel now uh, is producing about eighty-seven thousand dollars in taxes per acre. It wasn't even; it was it was kind of boarded up back then. So it was at uh, ten times the taxes of the Walmart. Um, the the Bay, Baymeyer building was crushing it at two hundred twenty-seven thousand an acre. So just for the show, I went ahead and and updated it. I went and knocked it down to just what the county taxes were um, per acre. And uh, let's see, this pop up. Yeah, here we go. Um, so 31,000, 85,000 and 3,000 and what they're paying in Polk County taxes. So y'all are Polk County taxpayers. This is what that's being contributed up in your, your neighbor up the street there. And I just grabbed one of your buildings downtown to put it in perspective. The, the Emil John, John building is pulling about $8,000 an acre. That building in the state that it's in right now is about two and a half times, uh, the Walmart production and county taxes. And is paying a city layer on top of that. So this is this is looking at your things in an apples to apples way and understanding the math behind it. Now, as you polish up your downtown, you're going to be harvesting more wealth in the process because those numbers are going to go up. So again, another bias that people have is like, you just want to have big buildings, Joe. It's like, no, that's not true. So we did a project in Charleston. I know that you had Vince Graham. So I'm going to show you some of Vince's stuff. But this is the Charleston three county area. Um, you can pretty much tell where downtown Charleston is. And when we presented this to them, I said, look, you, you know, you got a lot of oceanfront real estate here in, uh, in Folly Beach and all of this stuff. So let's just go ahead and wipe that out because you can't make another ocean. God made that. So this is what humans made. You can see the downtown there. And just for fun, Charleston's an old town. So we grabbed every building that predates the Declaration of Independence. So we have a birth date for our country, we have pre-colonial buildings like this. This is a building built in 1686. It's the oldest liquor store in the entire country called the Red Dot Liquor Store. Uh, this is a revolutionary getting his drink on, I guess. But that building is pulling $13 million of tax per acre versus the Walmart at $800,000. Here they are in plan. Or in plan. Um, so pre-1776 buildings, that 21 acres of them. And in uh, 2015, this is what they paid in county taxes for those 21 acres. So the county got that. The city, they pay a city tax and a downtown district tax on top of that, but the county gets $630,000. Their Walmart is basically the same area, 21 acres, and this is what it paid in that same year, 47,000. Now, now remember what I said, Th those, those buildings have paid 13 times the, the taxes of the Walmart, and they're not gonna disappear in 15 years. So this is longevity and long wealth the long game in your community. Little buildings can crush it. Um, just for fun, here's a little building in Boston that's seven feet wide, $62 million an acre, or one of my favorites. This one's in Alexandria, Virginia. It's it's skinnier than a smart car. Now, I wouldn't live in it, but somebody's living there. Like Create a diversity of product that people could use. It's been there since the 1800s, and it's producing $64 million an acre. And there's a pattern in this old architecture that we used to build cities this way because it's really, really smart from a tax production standpoint. So it builds community wealth. These are other townhouses. This one's a 700 square foot townhouse in Georgetown, 44 million. This one's 64 million, 67 million. Do you all see a pattern? You just, in many cases, these are illegal in, in cities. So that's just the building side, going back and taking the buildings off the earth and only looking at the dirt per acre. This is just the land per acre. You'd get what you'd expect by the beach, right? All the oceanfront real estate is like a wall of value right there because that dirt is super valuable because it has an ocean view. But check out the dirt in downtown right here. So let's kind of zoom into that. So here's the dirt in the downtown. All that value is there because of the walkability, because it's beautiful, because people want to be there. And it's incredibly stunningly beautiful. And it's had that value for a very long time. This is a kind of a post-World War II development of the city that grew out. And you can see how low the value, you can see where the commercial corridors are in the residential, but it's not nearly the value of Charleston. As you turn this model around, so you look toward the ocean, um, this is ION. So when you saw Vince talk about his project, um, oops, that's it. That's the dirt value under the building. So basically what he's done is he's created, you know, ripping off a pattern that was just across the bay there and replicated it and created the same kind of value. He's also created the same value. I told him, 
I was like, dude, you've, you've created the same value as the ocean front back there on the marsh. He's created that value in the, in the land whether with his design team in, in Victor as well. Uh, this pattern of new urbanism is not new for those of us that practice in it or go to conferences on it. We know that it's been done before. And you see this pattern of just the old is new again. Here's um, Shreveport, Illinois, or uh, Louisiana. I was just there uh, last week. You can see downtown kicking it off the map. This is a new urbanist community called Providence jumping off the map. You can have basically two downtowns or multiple downtowns. Um, and every, everywhere that we've done new urbanism, we see this pattern. This is uh, Fayetteville, Georgia. The downtown is actually over here, this one little purple spike. They built this new this new urbanism community called Pinewood Forest that's just crushing it in value here. They effectively made another downtown in their community. And it's it's potency of just the little buildings. It's nothing, it's not like a skyscrapers or anything, it's just townhouses. And they're actually pretty cool, uh, little townhouses, pulling about $12 million and $6 million an acre. Um, this is Covington, Georgia. Um, Downtown is in the center of the circle right here. And this is a new urbanism project called Clark's Grove that's mixed use. Pattern after pattern, when we see this in a community, we see that harvest of new wealth uh, come out of it. And then also, I know that you've, you've, you're, you've had Steve in your presentation in Serenby. This is Fulton in, in um, uh, um, DeKalb County. And here's Serenby, way the heck out here. Little old Serenby is crushing it where they built buildings and, and tax production. Uh, it's behaving like hey, a Joe, can I break in for a second? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, so Serenby, which Steve Nygren presented, uh, was uh, part of the subject matter of our symposium. We had in a kickoff event for Lake Wales and Vision about a week ago. So that was, that was March 20th. So um, we are... Uh, for prepping all the videos from those presentations to go onto the Lake Wales Envisioned website. So if people want to know what Serenby looks like and want to hear more about how Steve Nygren created it, um, they can, um, in the next few days, we'll be able to go to the lakewellsenvisioned.com website and see that and make, make the link between what you're presenting and what he showed. I also want to let everybody know that uh, the city's interim planning director, Autumn Coachella, has joined us as a panelist. So she's available to help with questions that come up during the Q&A. And we have a little button down at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. It's just to the left of the one that says chat in all likelihood. And everyone who's listening in, if you have a question for Joe, type your question in that using that Q&A button and uh, Amy can take it from there. Thanks, Joe. Cool, thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the pattern of that type of development and the reason why people did it made economic sense. And it makes economic sense today. If you go pull old literature, I was, I was showing Victor this uh, last week. This is an old book that I've got from 1931 on designing neighborhoods. And they have these tables in there. And if you just look at this, I mean, this is rocket science. There's value per acre right there. They were measuring this stuff. And it's almost like we've got collective amnesia after the depression and World War II, we just sort of forgot this stuff. Um, and it's, it's a pattern that was that made economic sense to build cities. And again, there's always pushback. Like, well, hey, Joe, I don't wanna live in density. I don't, I don't know if you all know Gwinnett County, Georgia. Uh, we did a presentation in Gwinnett County, Georgia. It's up near Atlanta. And Lawrenceville is a suburb of, of Gwinnett County, Georgia. They, they literally told me when I went there, I wasn't allowed to say like the George Carlin dirty words. I wasn't allowed to say four words. When I presented, I couldn't say the word urban, city, town, or municipal in my presentation because they said these were offensive and were rural people in Gwinnett County. Now, when your company is called Urban Three, I don't know, am I just three at that point? Can I not say my name? You know, it just it's comical to me that we have these biases. So here's Gwinnett County, and they told me they're like, we're outside the beltway, we're huge, we're 460 square miles. And I told my client, I was like, look, y'all, you're 812,000 people. And they're like, but we're a big county. We're huge. I was like, all right, fine. 860, 812,000 people divided into 460 square miles is 1,900 people per square mile. That's your density. Each of those little people is 100 people. That is less dense than De the DeKalb, Georgia. But we had all of this other data, so I showed it to them. I'm like, I, I just want you to realize this. Y'all are 200 people per mile denser than Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. What's in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina? And somebody goes, Charlotte? I'm like, yeah, yeah. That's got Charlotte in it, and it's less dense. This is Nashville. 
both of these places have a professional football team. There's no such thing as the Buford Cowboys, is there? This is Austin, Raleigh, Asheville, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. This is what this is what rural looks like. I don't know what y'all did here. And when we did their model, it sort of blew my mind. I asked my analyst, I'm like, could you could you turn it on its side? And there it is, looking at the side view of it. it looks like a 1970s shag carpet. It's the same thing straight across the model. And, and it's, it's like a doctor looking at your CAT scan. You could see the stroke happening. You're like, why are you doing this? This is what we typically see when we do a community. And we could see Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Hillsborough. And I could see their downtowns in them. That's where you're pr producing your, your wealth for your community. The suburban areas just don't do it. They're just, that's just the way our tax system works. So good, bad, or indifferent, they cover their entire county with the exact same stuff edge to edge. It's really difficult to come back from that. So the most potent building in their entire county is this building right here that was built in 1912. They have done nothing more potent than that building. And so when you look at when you look at all of these other places that are less dense, look at the wealth at the most potent buildings they all have versus what Gwinnett County achieved. So just to kind of make the point, we put three counties side by side in profile view. Uh, we've got Davidson County, which is Nashville, Travis County, which is Austin, and Gwinnett County, which has Lawrenceville. And we did like an economic heart monitor to pulse them out. And this is what you get. So we've got a peak value per acre at 192 million in Nashville, 476 million in Austin, and they're flatlining at eight. They have all the same horizontal infrastructure as these places and none of the value to pay for it. And you know, one of the county commissioners said to me, she goes, but but we're not urban. I said, I'm not telling you you're urban. And I never used that word in my entire presentation. You've got all the same horizontal infrastructure. You guys going broke yet? And she goes, yeah, yeah, we're broke. Well, how, how, how'd that happen? You know, the other thing is we'll see people go down the wormhole of we need to get, what about retail taxes? So here's Durango. In Colorado, they actually let you see all the retail taxes. In Florida, here's a little, uh, little wake up call. They, your state doesn't let us look at this stuff. Well, we can see it by zip code, but in Colorado, we can see it. The, the counties get all the property tax, the cities get the retail tax, but here's Durango and property tax model, downtown's killing it. This is the strip down here with the Walmart, the Home Depot, all that's right there. And then when you look at the retail taxes, downtown's still killing it in retail taxes. This is total taxes, jobs, any way you look at it, downtown's killing it. We had two businesses, uh, one in apples to apples against the Walmart. So Tim has a coffee shop, Tim Wheeler, and Peter Schertz has a bookstore. We put them side by side. So here's the bookstore compared to the Walmart in county property taxes per acre. Who would have thought that a bookstore and a coffee shop, what is that, 15 times the taxes per acre? Uh, seven times the retail taxes. A coffee shop and a bookstore are crushing Walmart in sales taxes and then jobs. So what's producing more wealth for your community? It's obviously those two little stores. Now let's ask the next question. Who's paying their retail sector employee more per hour? The, the, the small mom and pop shops or the Walmart? It's probably going to be the, it's going to be a nickel or a dime more, but it's going to be the mom and pop. Now who's hiring the accountant, the local ad executive, the attorney, is it going to be the, the blue side or the gray side? It's going to be the blue side. This is really simple economics if you just think it through. And we need to realize that it's not that the market is making this happen. These are taking advantage of policies that facilitate that subsidy. So when you don't have the money for the Greenway or the art teacher or a dancing traffic cop, it's not that you don't have the money. It's being churned through how your land is being used. And again, people have biases of we've got plenty of money. We're doing great, Joe. We're growing here in Florida. All right. Well, Florida, these are all the different states and how you operate. You operate mostly off property tax. The green is your retail tax. And then blue is transfers from the state and other things like that. Uh, when I say local, I'm saying city and county together. Um, your tax system is a little crazy in Florida. This In North Carolina, ours is pretty simple. Our tax value and our assessed value are basically the same thing. We get to mess around with the tax rate. That's how your tax bill happens. For y'all, you have all of these exemptions. Um, so I'll just show you to you from like $100,000 of commercial versus residential. I right out the door, you all know you get a homestead exemption. Boom. Your residential is taxed less than commercial, even though it's the same value, um, except for the school district. Um, that's a different number, but your this is these numbers are actually Pompano uh, Beach, Florida. So the city of Pompano gets five mills, the school gets six mills. So you're actually paying the school more taxes than what the city gets, which is kind of wild. But here's the kicker: 
the county, Broward County is getting double what the city's getting. So I asked them, I said, do you get double the service out of the county? Um, and that's the math, right? So here's the tax bill. You're actually paying more taxes if you're commercial are the same value than residential. That's the way your system works. Now, the real kicker is what you all did. And, and I actually was living in Florida when this was passed is a save our homes amendment. And it sounds great. You've, you've, you've restricted the, the growth of your personal house value by 3% or CPI, which is ever lower of the two. So that's how that works. So commercial is growing three times faster than residential can. Now, when you put in other economic factors, like let's say a recession or inflation, this is a, a, a chart of, of what happened over time in Brevard, Florida, uh, County, Florida. Um, you see uh, the gap that happens between the, uh, the, the market, when the market takes off before the recession, your tax bills are staying flat or lower because they're not going. That, that, that is very comforting to say, well, it's awesome. I'm not paying a lot of taxes. I'm not part of this crazy market. Well, when everything craters and goes through the re recession and climbs back out, notice how the the, retail, the property taxes doesn't climb as fast because there's a restriction called your cap rate. And so in 2021, y'all were capped at 1.4% of growth. Now to put that in com comparison with what's going on with asphalt, this is from FDOT. Asphalt was growing at 3% a year that same year and your revenue is restricted to 1.4 a year. Do you have enough money coming in the door if your revenues are at 1.4%, but when you have to go fix a road, you're paying 3%. Now, it's worse than this, folks. If you look at what happened last year, this is the uh, Federal Reserve uh, uh, economic data on asphalt. So it went from an index of 280 to 360. What that represents is a 29% growth in one year in the cost in asphalt and revenues were restricted to 1.4% or CPI, which is ever low over the two. This is not a recipe for continued success for any city. Basically, the only way you can afford your city is you have to grow. You have to get new people to move there. You have to take on more burden. That's the reality of your tax system. So again, a lot of folks just mis misunderstand why you need that income and how it's connected to cost. And I'll give you an example of that. There's a really bad example in California that we did in Lancaster, which is up and over the mountain from Los Angeles. They're out here in the desert. Um, the space shuttle's program is what kept them afloat. It's no longer doing anything out there at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, here's where they, they are. What kind of blew my mind is they, they developed uh, about 953 miles of roads. That's what they own now. So it's, I as a developer build you a development, hand you the roads. They're now yours forever. So Roads don't last forever. Every, in their case, every 30 years, they have to rebuild 953 miles of roads, basically. That's the diet that they're on. That's enough roads to go from Los Angeles to Portland. So if you had the conscious choice to build a road from Los Angeles to Portland, would you do it? Of course not. But, but again, we don't see these decisions because they happen over time, over many periods, over many life cycles of, of different um, leadership, of different generations of people. And they just accrue. They also is this fallacy of what how they get booked in your in your budgets. So if you look at your city budget, roads are listed as assets. Every time I sit with a finance officer, I explain to them that my computer is an asset. If I have a delivery van, it's an asset. If I had a piece of real estate, it's an asset. We all understand that. I can sell you the computer, the van, or the building. Can can you all pick up your roads and sell them to Orlando? No. That's a liability. So you should be looking at it like a liability and liabilities have to be repaired over and over again. So this is all their roads built over time. We started them in the early 1900s. They didn't have that many roads. And after World War II, they got really crazy. You can see in 1953, they built all those lane miles of roads. Well, that comes back for the first generation rebuild in this year. Um, so in 1983, when they rebuilt those roads, what did they do? They went out and let out more land. They got more development. They got more roads. Great. So this comes back with a second rebuild and brings along with it the new stuff. So we just stopped them in 2017 and said, what's your build rebuild cycle look like? This is what you're essentially carrying as your cost. So if you look back in time and look what they did to themselves in the 1950s, that's kind of crazy you, if you look backward. Now, I, I will give you all a hundred bucks if you can tell me and show me some document from the 1950s 
where they're, where they're penciling out the long-term cost of these roads. No one was doing that in the literature of the 1950s. In the 1920s and 30s, they definitely were. But somehow we just kind of lost that, that attitude. Like, we're modern, we're going to drive. The future will take care of it. Well, guess what? They doubled down in the 1980s because we convinced ourselves, this is who we are, Joe. We all like to drive. We're America. We're Californians. We love our cars. Okay. Well, you've just capitalized on stuff you can't afford and it's getting bigger and bigger. And I'm not even adding any more roads to it. And this is even without inflation. So this is the problem that a lot of American cities have is we don't pencil out stress test, essentially, what we're carrying. So when you flush their money into their road system, they can afford about half of it. And that's the paradigm and the effect of every American city that we've, we've analyzed. We see the same problem over and over again. Okay. I know this is a lot of heavy material to go through. There's ways out of it. You have to understand the patterns and what you can do. So also connect the dots on the money. In Eugene, we did a full return on investment model. This is their money um, coming out of the ground and, and taxes. This is a side view of the money. If, if this were a boat floating in the lake, what you have above the waterline is the revenue, the money coming in. Below the waterline is the sunk cost for the roads, the pipes, the sidewalks, all that stuff. So people live out here. Great. This is what you're paying and this is what you're paying in contribution for your your choice to live out there. This is what you're consuming in society for your choice of where you live. So if you net your cost against your revenue, this is your net position of what's in the black and what's in the red. Here's the top view of the model in 3D showing the net position. Any corporation is going to do this. I do this for my business. I'm not a billion dollar company. I wish I were, but your city is. So why aren't you doing it? So understand that, 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 that number. You can see downtown killing it here. If you lift this model up, like you're looking for a salamander under a rock or something like that, this is what you see, the spread of subsidy across the model. Now, this is a very large presentation that we did, but we just broke it down into building types. I call this the Brady Bunch slide. Um, we've got residential across the top, low density, medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium, and high, commercial, low, medium, and high. And these are the sticker prices. So the single family detached house um, on a quarter acre lot in Eugene, Oregon is subsidized to the tune of $1,400 an acre. That's the reality of the situation they're in. Now I'm not saying you need to, everybody needs to move into a townhouse, but you can see the net production just moving over into that, into that unit right there. So just be conscious of, of the costs in, in all this. And, and again, the reaction is, Joe, I want a house. I'm not, I'm not telling you not to have a house. Just don't do 80% of your land use in that subsidy pattern. That just, that's just not smart. So find some other ways to curb that and build more wealth so you can afford to do more of this. And a lot of this is sitting right there hiding in plain sight. If you cut your city up like a, like a tree ring, in, in, in our world in urban design, we call this the transect, but you got to balance it out. You can't just have one tree ring being 80% of your diet. Now back to those 1930s books. Um, here's a diagram. I was showing this to Victor. I was like, look, they, they invented Dover coal. Um, this is this is essentially the way that they designed communities back then with a core and residential around it, you know, a mix of development types. And they were actually measuring the roads and the cost of the roads and what kind of revenues you're getting. And you can see here that they have single family, two houses or duplexes, a multi-house, which is probably like a townhouse or a triplex, and then little apartments. The cost of infrastructure is so much less because you're getting so much more revenue on those properties than we're doing with single family. Um, and then this is a, a, a fun one. If you build the, the model development pattern where you're having a mix of those uses with residential, it's so much more affordable at a community level because back then the community had to pay for all those costs. Now the developer does it and turns around and flips it into your lap and you have to pay for that second rebuild. It doesn't work out that way. So this is why a lot of communities are in the red. So in Eugene's case, we recommended to do more stuff downtown. But if you look at the north side of downtown up here, there's this little thing called Crescent Village up there. That's a little new urbanist uh, plan up there. So we said, look, why don't you just focus on four areas and, and grow up some new wealth out there so you can accommodate that the stuff that's in the red right now. And it, this isn't to force people in anything. It's just to make smarter, more productive land use choices as a community and be imprudent. The patterns do matter, how you lay houses out. It's that simple. Um, one last example, this is 88 houses in a gridiron pattern in 88 houses in a cul-de-sac of cul-de-sacs, just single family. Both of these are the same thing. 
just different layouts. I love this one. This one's kind of cool. It's it's like lollipops on top of lollipops or something, but it's here's the cost of the roads, the cost of the water pipes, the cost of the sewer and storm sewer. Um, so the net cost of this development to the community, if you're paying for the replacement reserve of the street and its maintenance is about $122,000. What the community is actually paying in per year is about 21,000. So there is the deficit, about $100,000 a year. Doing the same thing on, on this one, I'm just going to blow through this real fast um, put in, to put them side by side. So here you can see they're basically, uh, you can, it's about one and a half times more expensive in cost for the development on the right than the development on the left. They're paying about the same revenue to the city. They're both in deficit, but one's almost two times the deficit for the same 88 houses. So as development happens, be aware. Yes, it's nice to have a cul-de-sac. It's nice to, I want my kids to play on a cul-de-sac. That's awesome. But you're creating a publicly funded driveway that's super expensive. And if you can afford it, awesome, keep going. But be honest with your citizens that those choices that we've been promised and in, in put into lots of cities is essentially eating our wallet. Um, you know, it's, it's just providing the wrong incentive uh, for development. And I'm going to give you one last one. This is in Indianapolis, Indiana. We took the whole entire county and just looked at what the average square foot they have per person. So it's Marion County, Indiana. This is Marion from Marion County. Here she is. She's got about 1,200 square feet of buildings, about 800 square foot of parking, and 900 square foot of road dedicated to her countywide. When it gets built, the assessor goes out there with a sticker gun and puts prices on the building and prices on the parking. You own the road. So in the case of Marion, they should be putting $22 a square foot into the road cost um, in front of the building and the parking. Now, just do the math on this. If you're, if you're running the taxes on 52 bucks or 75 cents, that means this building's paying 70 times the taxes that that parking's paying on the same damn cost. So just for fun, we took 50 percent of the taxes and I said let me just put them into a savings account and then like a Christmas fund or something like that and see how long it takes the parking to pay off its road and the building to pay off its road in time. So it takes 42 years for the building to pay off the road. It takes 3,000 years for the parking to pay off the road. Roads don't last 3,000 years. I don't know if y'all know that. They, they, they top out at about 50 years in Indianapolis. So here's the thing. They've actually, we put their roads end to end. They have enough roads to go from Indianapolis to Anchorage and they run out of money somewhere in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. This is the situation that city after city we've gotten into because we're not doing the math to understand this stuff. And, and finally, let me close with, with, uh, with, a, with an observation. Question every policy that's out there. Have a conversation with your assessor and be ready for some really weird stuff. The reason why I was at the assessor's conference was because of this map that we made. This is just, just land value per acre. There's no buildings here. This is just dirt per acre value. You expect the world to be like this area up here. Everything in this neighborhood is blue. So that's like uh, $15,000 an acre for the dirt. Um, you know, we, we do these maps because we look for stuff like this, these kind of weird anomalies inside the neighborhoods. That's telling us there's something, something weird going on. That's usually human error uh, from the assessor. Again, assessors aren't perfect and they're running the, the models the best they can, um, but this is showing where the models have an error. This right here is policy though. This is the dirt under the mall. So remember there's no buildings here, but you can see the, the mall aerial is there. Um, when I was presenting this at eight in the morning in, uh, in Cheyenne, Wyoming at the library, you know, I was just riffing on this. I was like, why is this $15,000 an acre? And when you cross the street, the same zoning category, same school district, everything, you cross the street and it turns orange. So it goes from 15,000 to 35,000 just by crossing the street. The assessor was sitting in the front row and she raises her hand and just belts out, no, 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 you don't understand. And I was like, what am I missing? And I'm not making this up, folks. She goes, they have more land. And the more land you have, the lower the value. The mayor started laughing and I go, really, I can get more of your limited commodity. You're going to give me a discount. She goes, well, there's less people that can afford larger tracts of land. When you have less people that can afford larger tracts of land, that means there's less of a market demand. So we have to offer that discount as part of the valuation. 
I was like, does, does it work that way for other limited commodities like a diamond? I'm sure there's less people that can afford like a diamond the size of my fist. Um, does it, is it cheaper per carat? And she's, she's like, well, no, it's just our standard. I'm like, this fellow's got three miles of streets around the property. This person's got 200 feet. What about the infrastructure? She goes, we don't count that. We don't care about that. Joe, this so is fantastic. Would, we have about two minutes left until uh, yeah, yeah. the Q&A. Yeah, I'm closing. Thank I'm you. I'm closing. Um, so I, I went to the assessor. Their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. I asked them, I'm like, how is this fair? How is this equitable? To their credit, they're like, it's not. I asked them where the standard came from. I'm like, did Moses deliver this to you? And they're like, no, we don't know where it came from. You need to talk to Larry. So I had to call this Larry, guy, Larry Clark, to talk with him about it. This manipulates the market. There isn't an invisible hand that's making this happen, folks. These are policies and the built environment is showing you how you're being taken advantage of. So our attitude is to be your accountant. Just go in there. Like your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, right? We're going to put your numbers on a map and show you what's going on. We, your, your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. So look at the map, see what's going on, understand this, do the math yourself, poke around in your, in your Polk County database and just divide the value per acre, the taxes per acre, follow the money, see what's happening. And just to close with uh, a quote from Edward Bach, the price of success is hard work, patience, and a few sacrifices. Doing that stuff that produces your wealth will take an effort. It's not easy. This, the, the suburban stuff that we've seen over the last 50 to 70 years is the easy way, but it's not long-term value and success. It isn't going to build your wealth. Um, a lot of our work is covered in our, our good friend Chuck Marone's books and Strong Towns. We highly recommend his stuff um, and his practices as well as his website. He, he covers a lot of this stuff. And thanks for letting me do some math with y'all. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, super interesting, lots for us to think about. And we have just a few questions in the Q&A we can go through. And if anyone has new questions, um, please type them in, but um, I'm gonna start. And Joe, if you wanna help answer these and Victor and Eric and others, if you wanna jump in as well, uh, please do. But uh, the first question is asking about uh, the Walmart slides at the beginning and asking how did Walmart get away with such a low valuation? Can you talk a bit about how uh, the, the valuation number, where that comes <laughs> yeah, from? Yeah, it's easy. It's a piece of junk building. It's that hard. It's like, seriously, it's like, a, it's a $50 a square foot building. They're just, they're just simple, dumb concrete walls, very, very few windows in them. And it's steel. It's like, it's a dirt cheap building. It's that simple. It's not hard. Look at a dollar general. I mean, is this any, some edifice of architecture that they're teaching at the University of Miami or up, up at uh, UF? No. These are just dumb boxes. I mean, it's that's it. It's cheap. It's, <laughs> don't hate the player, hate the game. If you build your system based on valuation, there is a perverse incentive to build junk in your community, period. A Quonset hut is going to be cheap. It's going to pay a lot of little taxes. But is that the wealth that you want for your community? Is that the longevity that you want to leave for your grandkids? Uh, so the next question, I, I believe this came in during the slides for Eugene, Oregon, and it's asking uh, for that example, uh, is there data available for property tax um, income per road mile paved? I am assuming it's not ideal. Um, you know, it's the, the easiest thing to think about, uh, you know, when we, when we present up north, you think like a snowplow. Um, you know, everybody's got to pay a fee that goes to the city that pays for the snowplow. But if I have 50 foot of frontage, plowing 50 foot of frontage is a heck of a lot cheap than plowing 250 feet of frontage. So that person that has that wider lot is consuming five times more snowplow than I'm getting, but yet we're paying the same taxes per square foot. Oftentimes what you'll find is I'm actually paying more taxes per square foot on the smaller lots. But it's just a lot of this is just having an exercise of being curious, just start asking questions. Um, what does it cost for resurfacing the mile of road in your community? And they just pull that number. Um, Strong Towns, uh, back in 2010, um, I was introduced to Chuck when he was doing, because he's a civil engineer, he was running through the costs of road rehab. Uh, a lot of our model is built on what he talked about. He's a civil engineer. So it was just, so we just followed his lead on that and just functioned the city the same way. And that's what it, we just visualized it. They ain't cheap. 
Uh, great. The next uh, question came in to the chat. It asks, um, the tax values you're quoting are per what time period, annual or over its lifetime seems unaffordable? Um, so it's annual. And every time we do a model, the way that we think about it is we're cut right to the simple of what do you pay? What do you pay per year? And, and then what, then we broke it down per acre. That, that's the only thing that we do that's kind of, kind of different is that Again, go go to seriously, y'all. Just go into the Polk County assessor's file. They have the they have the lot size of those properties. That's all I did for those properties up in um up in Winter Haven is divide the lot into its tax bill, and and that's where you get the taxes per acre. Um, the Walmart, incidentally, in 2019 was worse. It actually got better because they added some strip mall stuff around the Walmart in the last five years. So. Um, it got a little bit better, but it's still junk from a tax production standpoint because those aren't those aren't significant pieces of architecture. They're just strip mall. Right. Um, there's a longer question here. It says, I am a builder and develop sites based on market demand. Uh, do you know how this plan will work in Lake Wales? Would it not be wise to do a market study to make sure the product you describe, including driving development to downtown, is in fact marketable? Um, I do not question the financial analysis, but in reality, how do we know this plan will work in Lake Wales uh, without a market study? Well, first of all, I don't believe in market studies because I'm saying that with a grain of salt. Um, when we started doing building rehab in downtown Asheville, there were zero people that lived downtown in Asheville that weren't subsidized, that weren't some elder care facility or something like that. So that that building that I said we rehabbed and put apartments above it, we put 400 square foot apart, 400 to 600 square foot apartments in that building because these were all hotel rooms that we just glued together into apartments. The bank said it would never work. There wasn't a market study on the planet that would say that it would work because when you look at a market study, they're calculating who's already there. And so if we did a market study, the market study would come back and say, no one lives downtown unless you're subsidized. So therefore there's no market right? The banks wouldn't fund it. The banks were just like, oh, this is too risky. So we had to do it with 100% equity to prove that the market existed. And guess what? It was 99% leased up the day that we opened the doors on it when we got our CO. And then it's been 99% it's been leased up ever since. People would kill to have a 99% lease up, uh, leased up apartment building in any community. And it's a very desirable place. Downtown Asheville is now ridiculous. So it was about a I think the whole downtown value when we did that building was 100 million of value for all of our downtown, 100 million. It's now 2 billion. If we had done a market study, the market study would never say our downtown would be a $2 billion downtown in 30 years time. So again, it's, I'm, I'm saying that with a grain of salt. I know that this builder probably has to go to a bank and the bank's gonna ask for a market study. So it's just great. I think go and find a cousin find a community that's already worked on its downtown and do a market analysis there so that you have a comparable rather than looking what you got what you have right now. Um, and luckily the market has changed a lot. I can tell you that when I was at University of Miami back in the 90s, um, it, when I just graduated, like to stay to even live in a walkable neighborhood was an anathema. At least now people are doing that because the market has proven that people want that. If you build an environment people care about, they'll come in droves. Great. I think we have just one more question here, and then I'm going to ask if our team members have any uh, other questions. But this last question says, off the cuff, what are some of the most successful cities that come to mind? Is there anything from your analysis that you find um, you want to tell us about? You know, no one's perfect. Is, is anybody perfect in this, in this Zoom? You know, we're all human. So we're, everybody's going to have, every city is going to have its own bumps and bruises. And it's just whether or not you're, whether or not you're learning along the way and you're, you're, you're adapting. Um, the cities that do it the best um, are Canadian cities, where they actually have not only reserve accounts for all of their infrastructure, but they also keep growth funds. So when they grow, they invest in themselves the same way that we do as a business. We don't, we don't just, I just don't go out to the bank and take out a loan every time we want to come up with a new product. We create a, an R&D account to try to figure out how to grow our business that way. So it's just prudent business moves. Um, but again, look for other examples, ask around, find, find places that have, have done that. Like those examples I showed you in Covington, in Fayetteville, 
um, Serenby. These are examples that have produced wealth because they found some way to facilitate allowing that stuff to happen. Um, and it's just, so, it's not uh, easy. Um, and this is this is inspired by a question Carrie Reed posted in the chat. Um, and Carrie was asking about how you accommodate single family residential in better forms uh, for, and, you know, for example, what's the better, smarter way? Smaller lots, uh, less single family, more other things, conservation neighborhoods. So let me put it this way. We're going to have uh, growth and development inside the core. It's already underway. An infill is taking place, rehabs of historic buildings and older homes are certainly taking place. We're bound to also have some development at the edge. So if you're going to add a new neighborhood, what's what are the things a new neighborhood should have to hit your marks, hit your points, so that they the the net result of it is it was more worth having, uh, not less. And you said, yeah, a building neighborhood people will care about. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, there's um, you know, what you find is uh, more begets more. I mean, this is this is a, I mean, it's it's kind of almost become second nature to talk about it this way for anybody that's attended a, a Congress for New Urbanism or been part of the history of that organization. Is it, it used to be. It used to be hard to sell this stuff. It used to be hard to convince people that if you built all this stuff intertwined intertwine with each other, it would be good. But now there's enough data and enough evidence from enough developments. I mean, heck, y'all have done a bunch. Where the more that you add to it, the more valuable it gets, the more wealth it creates, the more it begets more. In a typical suburban pattern, it's the opposite. It's it's the first one out there wins. And then every new development thereafter takes away the value of the place because it becomes more hostile to walk or drive around. No one wants to bicycle. You're like, you know, your car is your um, prosthesis for getting around in your community. And you should be designing communities for an eight-year-old or an 80-year-old to get around because that's going to open up a broader market. It's also more healthy. It's more beneficial. And it produces more wealth from a taxable standpoint. They're a little bit more complicated. You have to, you have to care about the infrastructure and how it all comes together. That takes some detailed thinking. Um, but I would, I would say like, that's what I, that's what we see with all these developments. Um, and I could, I could pull up the model again, but y'all could just go back in the video and look at, look at Fayetteville and see how potent that village is compared to the old city. Um, you know, it, I, I, I checked out your, your, your annexation pattern, your city boundary, y'all annexed northward. Um, I don't know what kind of competition you were in with Winter Haven or something, but you, you took down a lot of land now. Um, you could build essentially a second city within your boundary, um, like a, a twin place. So just don't do it all as a monoculture, because um, that's just it's it's easy, but you're not gonna you're not you're not gonna gain gain wealth. You have to also buttress your current downtown um, while you're at it. There, there's other things you want to have a a parking strategy in your current downtown. You want to have it. when we when we think about the car moving around on a on a street. Somehow we're okay with that being some sort of socialized goal. Everybody should have a car moving around. But when the car stops, it becomes a private problem, right? It's like, you need to have more parking standards. It's like, why? Why don't we, why don't we be more efficient about it? That's what I think Asheville did a great example with that, where they, we dropped our parking standards in our downtown in the, in the 90s. And then the city did a proactive parking structure program because we had all these buildings with no part. It was, it would be stupid when you have two buildings side by side and you tear one down and make a parking lot. Like, why would you do that? So they made a parking structure program so that everybody could benefit off the parking. Now the city charges money for the park. Everybody's okay with that. Um, so it's, you won't be okay with it if you just come out the door with charging for parking, but you have to think about it as an infrastructure. Long game, play the long game. Great. Was well, this too um, nerdy for you all? Was this good? I thought it was great. Um, okay. <laughs> and we'll end up and ask uh, anyone else listening tonight. We're just about at the end of our hour, but uh, if you all have additional questions, um, you can continue to message us uh, at the project website, lakewalesandvision.com. Um, so you can go there, um, submit your comments, and a reminder to everyone uh, the charrette date's coming up. Uh, in April, uh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, starting April 14th, uh, running through April 20th. And again, all those details are on the project 
website. So um, thank you, Joe, so much for tonight. You've given us all, I think, a lot to think about. Um, and thank you, everyone who was able to join us. Um, and uh, Victor, if you don't have any last words, I think we'll wrap up for tonight. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, everybody.